Hello, Vol Nation. Welcome to another episode of Believe in Tennessee Football. I am your host, as always, Kyler Kerbison, joined by Reed Bacon. This is a good one this week. We're going to break down the offensive side of the ball. Me and Reed got a chance to go to a practice last Tuesday or two Tuesdays ago and really get in depth, really be in the huddles, be right next to all those guys and understand what the offense is going to look like next year. Uh, you know, we let you know who we think is going to play and the big controversy at quarterback, who's our QB one. So uh, you guys are not going to want to miss this. Let's start the show. Tie the game. Snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no, sir, Reed. No, sir, Reed. Final score. Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. Looks, loads up. Fires long for the end zone. The pass is going to be caught on Tennessee. Tennessee wins by Tennessee to one Jennings. Jennings makes the catch in the end zone on the Hail Mary. Down to the 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. What did he do? All he did was score. Joey Pitt, touchdown on play number one. All right, so before we jump into the show, you know we got to start with our presenting sponsor, Bet Online. So I know March Madness is over, but you still got the NBA, you got NHL going on right now. So there's plenty of things to be betting on, and Bet Online is the place to do it. Uh, bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Uh, it has you covered with all the news, the scores, the odds, and it's the best way to place your bets. And it's free to sign up. So head to the website, betonline.ag. Or use your mobile device and sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. I am so excited for our newest sponsor, uh, Monster Bass. Uh, Monster Bass is a fun and affordable way to get the best new baits from the fishing industry's top brands delivered to your door each month. Uh, It's a premium subscription fishing company that handpicks the best baits uh, based on where you live and where you fish. So no more guessing on which baits are going to work and just, you know, leave it to the pros at Monster Bass. Uh, Basically, it's like having your own personal fishing guide and it's changing the way bass fishermen shop for baits. They're quickly becoming the number one fishing brand of anglers everywhere. They've got the best baits, the best brands, and you're covered by the industry's best customer service. So, if you want to catch bigger bass this season, head over to monsterbass.com and use the code VOLS10, V O L S 10, and get $10 off your first box. Sign up for Monster Bass now. All right, welcome in. Uh, with me and my co host Reed, we're going to break down the offensive side of the ball from the spring practice we went to. Now, I'm going to let you guys know, we didn't go to the open practice to everyone that was on that Saturday. We actually went to one last Tuesday. A little more intimate, a uh, little more knowledge, just watching the entire practice, watching individual drills, one-on-ones, team settings, all that kind of stuff. So this is a little more in-depth than you might have heard from other places. Um, so like I said, we're going to go over offense Reed, where would you like to start? Do you want to start on the big topic of, to- of quarterbacks? This is actually where I want to start. So the people know they've already listened, hopefully listened, um, to the defensive one. We actually, as Kyler mentioned, we did one whole pod on this past Sunday. We crushed it for like two straight hours. We had some te- <laughs> technical difficulties. So we're kind of reiterating some stuff that we already said. Hopefully we do better since we had a trial run. But I do actually want to start with where I started on that pod. And that was the entire experience of the day. I thought it was so awesome. Obviously, it was first class. You know, we showed up at like 3 o'clock on Tuesday. We had to do our COVID test. Um, Obviously, I wanted to see how they treated Kyler. Well, um, you know, um, uh, Scott Altizer Mm -hmm. uh, was there, who he knew Kyler. That guy was so great to us, so awesome. We went in, we did our rapid COVID test, obviously stayed away from everybody until we got cleared. 
Um, and then we got to walk through the coach's office and, um, it just so happened that a couple of the coaches came out and met Kyler. They were very excited to meet him. They were super friendly, super nice. And, you know, they, and I'm not like, you just like, we've been around enough coaches. We've been enough around enough people that, you know, who are good people who are nice. Like they're not just talking to you. I mean, you're, 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 you're involved for life, but you're not Peyton Manning. Like they don't have to drop what they're doing, but they were, <laughs> but they were very nice. They were great. Uh, Hypo was awesome. Um, he was he was great to to Kyler and even to myself. He was super friendly. He just seemed like a good down to earth guy, and he didn't. I didn't get any Butch Jones vibes off of him, which were you know sketchy. I'm sure quiet. everyone everyone yeah. is liking to hear that one. Yeah, and then um, you know, and I never met Jeremy uh, personally, like I did with Butch or, or Dooley. But uh, man, Hyper was great, uh, like you heard on the defensive podcast. One of the first things he said is, hey, we're going to be all right and we're going to get it turned around, but we just got to get some guys in here first. Everyone knows that. Everything you've ever listened to, we're telling you we're at a deficiency with talent. Um, but everything was first class. They were great. Uh, we got to kind of walk around. I, I didn't ever feel like we had to be like ushered from one spot to another. Like they literally just kind of let us have free reign. Once our COVID test, they were like, hey, Kyler, you know what you're doing. You know where you've been. Of course, me, I'm a kid in a candy store, so I'm asking <laughs> Kyler to – to show me around and take me to different places. And, Reed, uh, Reed, Reed was trying to do power cleans in the in the weight room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but the weight. Yeah, but he showed me the new weight room. New weight room looks great. Um, and then we just got to go do our thing at practice. Like I don't think people understand. Like I legitimately felt like a coach at practice. I mean, I could literally. Well, first off, Kyler was like in drills. He was there talking to the Mays <laughs> brothers, talking to offensive line. Like I'm sh like he was literally like as close as a coach was like in the drill, like, and obviously they don't care that he's there and I'm standing there. I'm a nobody. And they're just like, we're totally cool with it. Got to talk to some other coaches that came up, introduced themselves to me. Like it even, you know, like I mattered, but I just, we got free reign. Like we were, we were on our cell phones. Like it was just really laid back. It was great that it felt that way because the other times I've been over there, it didn't feel that way. Um, yeah. So, anyways, everything was first class. Everything was great. Uh, the coaches were great. Um, yes, let's start with quarterback because it's what everyone cares about. So, go ahead and you, you start with what you think. Yeah, so, uh, like Reed said, we pretty much had full reign at, at the practice, um, able to do whatever we wanted. And, yes, I was standing with the offensive line, uh, actually coached uh, slash trained three of them in high school, the, both the Mays brothers and Ollie Lane. You know, I also helped coach up Jacob Warren in high school. So I know a few of the guys that are on the team, which, you know, is nice to see them again and, uh, you know, see that they're doing great. But because we had this access, because I could be right behind the plays as they're happening, um, right behind the huddle, can kind of, you know, see how everyone acts, not just performs, but acts out there. Me and Reed said it to each other. In this quarterback race, it is Brian Mowers to lose. And that's not even because, he, you know, he ran with the ones or anything like that. It is because his confidence, his swagger that he had out there, you know, how he held himself in those huddles, um, being around the guys. And, I mean, he performed. He performed well at practice. I thought he performed the best out of – you know, the three quarterbacks and him, Hooker and Bailey. So I 100% think this is Maurer's job. And, I, and you know, Reed agrees also. Yeah, um, it's funny because leaving that day, you and I were like, oh, we'll bet our entire bank accounts that Brian Maurer's going to be starting. And then we hear some of the stuff that comes out like, hey, each of these quarterbacks knows the day that they're going to be running with the ones or having their day or having – you know, their opportunity. So you go, so you know what, like that might've been the day that Hendon Hooker was just running with the threes and we didn't know it, but I'm also going off. Like Kyler said, we're both going off of just the vibe, just a hundred percent, the vibe, how Brian Maurer was carrying himself, how he was around his teammates conducting. Like if I didn't know who Hendon Hooker was and was looking for number five, besides the fact that he looks pretty good as an athlete, I wouldn't have really known like who he was like, yeah. You know, and, 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 and like I said, maybe – and Kyler and I are going to hope to go back in the fall camp, which closer to season, so maybe we'll learn more. But, like, maybe then we'll have a different vibe. But, like, 
I thought each of the quarterbacks did something okay and did fine. I thought so. all of them were a little inconsistent on throwing the ball, but we all know that. I mean, Maurer makes a good throw, and then he makes a bad one. Um, and then Harrison Bailey would maybe throw and make a good ball and then a bad one. Hendon Hooker, I didn't see him make a ton of throws. Um, a lot of the times, because he was running with the threes, he didn't have time. He was just kind of taking off and running. Um I still think it's going to be a, a sub, opinion wise. I still think it's going to be a quote unquote race, but just from the day we saw, there's no way we can't trust our eyes and not go with our gut when it seemed like it was Brian Mowers to lose. Yes, I, I agree. Um, and you do make a good point. Like, you know, when you are running with the threes or twos in any situation, they're, they're not as good as the ones. So wide receivers don't run the exact right route. Offensive line doesn't block that well so sometimes it can look worse in the other groups but I just can't get over the fact what I saw how I saw Brian Maurer confidence level his mobility in the pocket um and and you know the thing about Brian and, and what everyone says about him is you know he's a turnover machine he you know tries to force balls uh here and there and doesn't doesn't really take care of it I don't think he's going to have the ability to do that in this offense. It's going to be very regimented, very under control. And if he does, he knows he's out. This isn't a scenario like last year where Garantano can throw four picks, two pick sixes in a game and still be playing. This is not that because there's so much competition between these three. And this is a new coaching staff. As soon as one messes up, we're bringing in the next one which I, I mean, it's honestly refreshing from, you know, what we saw last year as fans just pulling our hair out saying, why is Garantano still in the game? Please just put somebody else, just try something else. Um, so I think this competition is good. And I, like, I, like we said, I, I think this is Mowers. And I cannot wait to go back during camp and, you know, be able to see them working then and see if there is that improvement because, I mean, you really think about it. We're at the start of spring. They still got a couple more weeks. You still got all the workouts, all the little seven on seven stuff you'll do with your your teammates in the summer, and then fall training camp. There's so much room to grow during this time period. All right, got to shout out another sponsor. Uh, and I speak for everyone. I think when I say that getting sunglasses is one of the most frustrating things, especially losing them or breaking them, you know, you buy the really nice ones, but lose them in the water, lose them in the lake, and you never get them back. But it's time to make your outdoor experience better with Keenan sunglasses. They are made exclusively exclusively with polarized lenses for optimal clarity. They're made with Japanese optics that make their lenses clearer, lighter, and stronger. And Italian handcrafted frames that are impossible to scratch. So they're very, very durable. So use the exclusive code KeenanCast15 at Keenan.com to receive 15% off your first pair. That's K A E N O N C A S T 1 5. KeenanCast15. Keenan, clearly better. Yep, it's going to be – I mean, I'll, I'll just be excited to see it when the first game of the year. I mean, ultimately, that's when everyone will know. We'll just – all we can do is trust our eyes and trust what we saw. Um, all right, I want to jump into – before we get into the big hefties up front, which is what you care about, I do want to talk about running back. And I firmly believe, and Kyler believes this too, it was funny, we both thought the same thing, I think running back is the one position we are both least worried about, um, partly because I do trust Heibel, and I do trust that he's going to be able to, if the, if the offensive line stays remotely healthy and plays decent, I think we're going to have plenty of people that can be productive. All the people that we saw, we, we believe in them, and, and but we also believe in Heibel, we believe in the scheme. So I'm not saying we're going to be a, a prolific rushing team that will come with more and more talent, uh, especially up front, and, and hope we have health. But between Jabari Small, D Beckwith, Marcus Pierce, Jalen Wright, um, a guy who wasn't practicing but looks just like a good player is, is the, the Juco kid, Tyron Evans, number eight. I mean, he looks like a nice, squatty, 
you know, good trunk, good little athlete. And then, you know, one of the first runs of the day that we saw that was in team drill um, busted out for like 50, 60 yards, like look really good. And I'm like, who is that? And they're like, he used to be a walk on. And we're like, what? And we see it was number 28. So it was Marcus Pierce. I mean, this guy came from Maribel College and it was like, what? So, I mean, I didn't know who he was. I looked him up after I left and it was just really neat to see, like, I guess kind of his story come from Dallas, Texas. So he probably played good high school ball and then ended up at Maribel College. And now he's over here. And I just, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, it seemed like it didn't matter who was going to be back there. Um, I mean, um, Hodge from, uh, from uh, Maribel was getting some run. I mean, mm-hmm. D Beckwith is absolutely huge. Massive, I mean, he looks so massive, massive individual. Yes, yes. He literally looks like a thin defensive end. Not not thin because he is thin, but just like a thin defensive end. And then when you look at him at running back, he's a mammoth man. So, like, running back, I was – I'm not going to say I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed with just one individual, but with the group, I'm like, I'm not worried at all. Like, I think – No, they should... and it, it's almost insane that, you know, we lost our two backs that ran the most last year, and we still have all this depth at running back because – I thought for sure that would be a place to drop off. But like you said, you know, watching Marcus Pierce just take that 50, 60 yards um, and literally running past linebackers and DBs and just seeing the size of D uh, Beckwith. And and I honestly believe we could have three, maybe four running backs that get up into the 500 yards rushing, like, just split it all up yeah. in between all of the running backs, even playing field. And with all that depth and the high up tempo offense that we have, it is so good to have that because guys are going to get freaking tired as crap, especially skill yeah. guys. How fast you have to go, how you have to line up, looking over at the sideline, getting to play, running routes, coming back in. So that is going to be huge for us moving forward in the depth percent, like depth. Yes. So I said, Tyron Evans, we didn't get to see him, looks good. And then we saw Jabari Small, look good. D Beckwith, massive man, ran fine, ran good. Marcus Pierce, walk on, look good. Jalen Wright, saw him a little bit. And then a guy that I didn't even mention, if I'm not mistaken, I saw him and he was practicing, was Antonio Malone. It was hard to see some of these smaller guys in some of their jersey numbers, but, like, if it was him, dude's a redshirt freshman, 5'10", 216, like, I'm like, if any of these guys are in the game, like I'm, I'm still not worried about it. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're all going to be fine. We'll see who picks up the offense best, who's best with his hands out of the backfield and maybe who can run block. But I mean, running back, we should have plethora of options, even if we did have some unfortunate injuries. Yes, I agree. I agree. And that's, it's so great to hear now for all those who listen to our defensive uh, podcast, you can kind of, you know, maybe come to a conclusion that maybe some of these linebackers weren't good enough, and that's why there was 50, 60-yard runs by these running backs. But I still think they were very impressive in finding the hole first, bursting through. And I made this comparison to Reed. I, I think Marcus Pierce is – is he feels like running back one just watching him and what he did. And he reminds me of Maurice Jones-Drew, just not quite as thick as Maurice Jones-Drew because I think he was pushing like 220 – and Marcus is more like 195, but he's shorter, 5'8", 195. He's got thick, thick legs and, and can really find those little cracks, uh, you know, in the run game, which is just so awesome to see. Um, I will say this. I, I'll i be surprised if Mark – I'll be su- – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, cutting out. What did you say? No, you're good. Go ahead. Oh, I, it's the, I guess we're our connection's a little off tonight. Um, no, I'll be surprised if Marcus Pierce is the starter – maybe he – I mean, I still think he'll probably be Jabari Small. But but then again, it's a crapshoot. Like, I, I don't know. Like, who who knows? But I guess I would just be surprised if we're trotting out to walk on from Maribel College. But, like I said, we saw him. We liked him. I don't really care who's starting because I think they're all going to be fine. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. Um, So, now we'll jump into the offensive lineman, you know, my favorite part. It's pretty much where I spent all day is watching – the O-line and D-line and, you know, had Reed watch the skill guys uh, as much as possible. But um, offensive line, I'm super excited about. I think, you know, there's solidified guys that I mentioned before in some earlier podcasts that I just know are going to be out in the field. That's the Mays brothers. 
and, you know, pro- most likely Darnell Wright. Um, and then, you know, it's going to be a competition for guard spots. But honestly, like when I look at the offensive line, what makes me feel the best is there are dudes pushing 315, 320, big guys out there. Because a lot – I mean, it's happened in the past where – recent past where, you know, no offense to – some of the guys who came in, I like them a lot as people, but if you're one or if you're 280, 285, and you're trying to play O line in the SEC, it's not enough. Like you have to be over 300 just to deal with those boys up front. I mean, Georgia and Bama and Florida are going to tear you apart. You have to be on your game. You have to be full fled, like heavy individuals. So, that was good to see. Um, and I honestly, I think there's a good amount of depth. There's always injuries that happen on the offensive line. So it's good to see depth, uh, to be able to know that someone can come in and, and replace the next guy. Like at tackle right now, it is a competition between Cade Mays, Darnell Wright, uh, Dane Davis, and Calvert. And that's four quality guys huge big individuals at tackles that are competing for those two spots then you got you know Spragans, Carvin um Chris I'm not even going to try and say his last name cuz I'll mess it up but number 77 they're all competing for those guard spots I think the only one in my mind that's solidified is Cooper Mays at center he is smart he has the playing experience from last year he seems like number one center. And I got the chance to talk to him and he explained how the offense works a little bit. And something that they do is call out one word to let everyone on the offensive line know exactly what they're doing on that play, who they're blocking, what double teams are happening. And that is so great because it works so well with the up-tempo offense, makes everything faster, and it simplifies stuff. A lot of times teams will catch on to the calls that you're making in my last year at Tennessee, we literally just stopped making calls up front because they would catch on and it was like, hey, you know what you're doing, right? Like you just trusted the guy next to you that he knew what he was doing. You didn't have to say something to him to, you know, let him know what to do on the play. He was smart enough. So I'm super excited for all these guys. I thought they did very well throughout the practice and – um you know, Cooper said he, he was being honest. He goes, we're killing it today. It's not always like this. Sometimes the defensive line gets us, but we're killing it today. Because in my mind, I thought they were locking them down on one-on-ones. They were, you know, winning up front in, you know, the full line drills. And I, I love to see it. I don't know if you got to check it out at all, Reed, but what, you know, is there anything that you saw individually? Yeah, I think it shows how much I know about offensive line play to practice when I walked up I was like dude do you think some of these guys like do we even look big enough and good enough and you're like what like yeah we're good size offensive line I'm like all right see you later <laughs> yeah well I mean here. when you're looking at me I mean everyone around me out there was almost almost everyone was taller than I am now they're in cleats and helmets and everything like that but like I played tackle at 6'4 315 and I was undersized but, like, all those guys are big, long, lanky dudes. I mean, all all of them are pushing six, 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 seven. Those tackles, you know, Wright, Mays, uh, Davis, and uh, Calbert, they're all pushing that, and they're all big, heavy individuals. So, I, I loved it. Well, yeah, and I think, for me, um, the Davis kid we, we that we looked up, who was a walk-on from up in, uh, like, the – you know, Tri-Cities or East Tennessee area, Dane Davis, I mean, dude looked good. I mean, for me, I mean, I was like, I didn't, I didn't know if he was like some three or four star recruit that I just didn't know about, but looked at him and he's a walk on. And as a fan, I'm like, or hell as a former walk on, I'm like, I'm rooting for all of them. But then I'm also yeah. like, yeah, I don't know if I want a former, <laughs> I don't know if I want a former walk on starting it, um, you know, starting at left tackle. But like I told you when we first recorded this for it crapped out, if he somehow starts, that's incredible for us because that means he's the coaches trust him enough to start. That means um, Darnell Wright will probably be starting. Then we get to put Cade Mays at, at right guard. That'd be incredible. But I mean, 
I will say I was impressed with them on the on on the one on ones. Like Elijah Simmons got got Cooper one time, yeah. um, and and that's fine. But like I felt like they did pretty good. I mean, Greg Emerson won one one. Tyler Barron won one. Um, but I, I thought Byron it was a young, good, my boy. Yeah, I thought it was. A, I thought it was a good back and forth. I thought the offensive line a couple times, like they set their ground, they got in their spot and anchored down, and like they did, they did a good job. So, um, yeah, that will be more one. I feel very confident when I'm watching offensive line in a game and like picking up on stuff. But in practice, yeah. I, just sometimes it's hard for me. Yeah, so. when it's when it's so individualized. Um, and you're just like watching from behind at field level, it is tougher to understand everything. Like I would love to get actual yes. like tape yes. of practice and just be I able to like it would, rewind, yeah. fat, rewind, rewind, re- and just like watch their steps, watch everything that they're doing because that's where you can learn the most. But, you know, seeing them out there, seeing them compete, I I really did enjoy it. I think, I think Davis has a good shot if he, you know, if he keeps – progressing and playing well out there to, you know, be a starting left tackle, which would be amazing. I mean, it, life is freaking tough for walk-ons. Um, you know, I saw it, I, I didn't experience it, but I, I saw it. it. It's, it's not, it's not all sunshine and roses uh, for them, but, and, and, and I would love that. Like you said, to, to put Kate at guard would be such a big deal because he is one of our best offensive linemen for sure. Most experienced, has played the most positions, but he said so himself. He's more comfortable at guard. That is what he likes. He played that more when he was at Georgia. You know, he played that a good amount last year. Yeah, he and, told you that at practice, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He said that at practice, like, man, I, I wish I could play guard. And, you know, sometimes it just happens where you got to play tackle because you're the best tackle or – the guard that we have is a better guard than the tackle that's behind you. So there's all those little nuances in the offensive line that you got to kind of work around um, or figure out when you're, you know, making your starting five. Um, but all I really want is a solidified starting five. Cause I was fed up last year seeing so many different dang rotations coming in I mean, it really pissed me off because you can't get in a rhythm. You can't understand the guy that you're playing with. And it, it just, you know, you're coming in cold. Someone who's just like watched a quarter of football and then jumps in there and then just like trying to prove himself. And it's just not going to work. There's, I still, I, I still, honestly, it's like one of those like mysteries of the world. Like I, I would love to just ask for like, what were you doing? Like, I don't know if he was worried about playing everybody so he didn't lose transfers or if he was like, hell, oh, this year, this is a COVID year. I'll play a bunch of people and next year it will matter. And he thought he's going to have his job. Like, I don't know what he was thinking, but I've never seen it be shuffled that, that much during a season and, yeah. and during games. Like it wasn't like they rotated during games. Like they wrote it during at each series. Like, yeah, not, it was I mean, insane. I mean, I mean, yeah. Like it, I, I meant to say like game to game, like they were going series to series, but um but yeah, I, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I don't, I don't, I definitely don't see him doing that this year. I'd be shocked if they do. Um, and to piggyback off what you said, it would have been much easier for me to be able to watch film. And I would, I would love to do that if we somehow had film of practice and would go back and watch it. But being on the field level, I, it, it was hard for me to, to pick up on stuff that, you know, so um, I'll be more excited to watch that maybe orange and white game or, yeah. um, you know, an actual season. Yeah, just be able to record the orange and white game and watch it over. I mean, that's what I was doing last season. I was just recording every game and re-watching it, you know, the following Sunday or Monday to, like, really get uh, my breakdown on it and what I thought. So sometimes that bird-eye view is a lot better uh, when you're trying to just understand what's going on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm excited. I think, you know, last week's pod – Talking about defense, we were a little down on the defense and worried about the defense and concerned how good they were going to be. And, you know, we need more guys in there. We don't have depth. On the offense, it's the other way around. I mean, I'm very confident in the offensive line. They have a ton of depth, a lot of experience at every position. Even though we lost, you know, Wanye, and there's still other guys that can step up. 
the running back position, there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of good guys out there. They look the part. Um, they seem like they understand the offense well. And at quarterback, we, I mean, I think, you know, whoever does start with all this competition that's been going on, it, it is going to be a legit good quarterback for us. Um, now we'll jump into wide receivers. Reed, I know you watch them a little bit more. Like I said, I was with the O-line, D-line, watching their one on one So you got a chance to watch wide receivers one-on-ones. And you might have talked about it a little bit with the defensive side of the ball when you are talking about DBs. But, you know, what kind of stuff did you see at wide receiver last Tuesday? Um, so Jalen Hyatt, stud, we know that. He's a ball player. He proved that as a true freshman. I thought it was funny that when we were walking to practice, he was walking out with us. So I made sure to – start walking a little bit slower because I want him to pass us and, and to see. And I don't know why I thought this. Reed was, bow, him. Reed was bowing up to him, trying to get – what's up, bro? What's up, baby? Come on now. <laughs> you don't want these hands, guys? I'll lock you down, bro. <laughs> hey, hey let, me, hey, let me get out here and DB. Um, <laughs> that's what we need. Let me go play DB. These guys will all have a bunch of confidence <laughs> yeah. after going up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but um, – so it was funny. I, I don't know why I seen him on TV. I thought he was like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, like, because he looks so wiry and stringy. But he's, like, not a big guy. Like, I mean, he's six foot 170, but, hey, whatever. I would have loved to see him practice. He wasn't practicing. Um, but, I, listen, I'm very confident in him. I saw what he did last year. I would be very surprised if he didn't build off that. So I think we're, we're good there. Guy I also really wanted to watch was uh, Malachi Weidman. Um you know, big time recruit coming in. He didn't play much last year. I don't know what was going on. I wanted to see him this year or see him at practice. I, you know, I don't know if he couldn't pick up the offense or if he was injured or whatever it was. Um, you know, but he didn't practice. So, anyways, talent wise, he he should be fine. Um, but but still, like, I still think this is in a way like kind of like the running back. I think. We're not going to have an elite guy, but we're going to have some good ones. And then we're going to have some good ones that look maybe even better than they are with Heupel um, yeah. because of the offense. Um, obviously, uh, Vilas Jones, he's going to be there. He's He'll he'll be a good redshirt senior leader. He can produce. We saw that. Um, you know, other guys that stood out to me, um, Cedric Tillman made a few plays. Um, and then, um, uh, Ramel Keaton, super lean, super skinny. But I, every time I looked up, I felt like he was making a good catch, making a good play. Um, Walker Merrill, true freshman from, from, um, there in Nashville, he made some really nice plays. I thought he had some good physicality and some of their one-on-one, like, you know, blocking or hitting, um, until he went out. Um, so, I mean, plenty of guys that look like they could be there. I will say this, um, you know, and, and you heard it on the defensive podcast because I was talking about Jack Jancic, uh, you know, balling out in some one-on-ones yeah. and making some of our starting DBs look bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, seriously, the guy's not going to play or anything. Or if he does, I'd be very surprised. But, you know, uh, it was funny to see – you know, as Catholic boys, we love seeing the Jancic boy out, there, you know, see Jack out there representing, making some legit nice plays, um, saying that the starters are trash, which was hilarious. <laughs> um, and then another guy, uh, I, I mean, he was running with the ones, but there was obviously a lot of injuries and a lot of different stuff. But uh, Tanner Dobrucky, 5'9", mm. 190 pounds. Um, I guess he was either a walk on or whatever, but long hair, hard to miss him because he's a little guy, but like he was getting out there, getting a lot of run, a lot of play, making good catches. And the way I look at him, like, bro, with high pool, any of these guys could potentially be good and put up numbers. Yeah. Um, so from what I saw, I mean, th- they looked fine. Like, I, you know, we're not going to have, you know, like a first or second round draft pick, I don't think, out of out of this class, maybe if a Hyatt or Wyman talent wise put everything together. But I was happy with what I saw. I thought they competed. I thought they blocked well. Um, you know, and 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 I, you know, I was I was fine with what I saw. Like I said, 
Um, the couple, you know, like I said, Ramel Keaton and uh, Tillman were some of the guys that I saw, you know, kind of the ones that stood out to me and some of the one-on-one stuff and team stuff. Yeah, and I think you might have said this last time. It was, you know, when we recorded it the first time, it, you it liked the guys that were, you know, out there that were actually practicing, but it, it kind of reverted back to the we, we need to get dudes in here you got guys that can make the catch that can get you the seven yards on first down, but you don't have the, you know, the Tonys from Florida, the Kyle Pitts from Florida that are going to break two to three tackles and take it the distance, you know, that you might break the one tackle and get a good chunk, but to take it the distance, some of the, you know, guys that Alabama's had Julio Jones. I mean, I don't know how many different times he took a freaking screen to the house when he was at Alabama. He did it well, to even, us very yeah. first play my uh, junior year. I'm pretty sure it was. It'll, very first play or, or might have been No, you're thinking about year. No, you're thinking not Julio. You're thinking about uh, Amari Cooper, I think. I thought Julio was still there because what, what class did he come out of? No, I don't think he was there while you were there. But anyways, <laughs> the, point, the point being is, you know, they've had Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, uh, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley. Then you go to the LSU guys, Jamar Chase, um, Justin, Justin Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah, and then, like you said, Tony. Uh, Pitts. Pitts. Yeah, I mean, and even like A&M, Texas A&M, and even, um, you know, a bunch of these – I mean, L- or, uh, Ole Miss will have a guy drafted. So, yeah, once we get one of those guys, that instead of going seven, eight yards, he goes 47 yards for the house. Yeah, that, that'll be great to see. Yeah, so. exactly. You know, and I, I love Josh Palmer. I think he's awesome. I think definitely quarterback play affected how good he could have been or, you know, the amount of numbers he could have put up. Um, but it definitely felt like once Jawan Jennings left, there wasn't that dog, there wasn't that guy in the wide receiver room. And, I, I mean, I feel like I, I can be honest and say that. Yeah, Jennings was just a special player from that from that leader dog mentality, though. So, yeah. but I but I, I agree with you though. Yeah, I love that guy. So, I mean, entire synopsis when we're looking at it, offense is looking good, defense is not so yeah. much. Um, which kind of was what we were thinking before the season started. I mean, you know, before we went to practices, hey, you know, defense is pretty depleted. There, you know, offense is going to have to score a lot. Uh, to be able to keep up with, you know, defense letting up a lot of scores. But, heck, Ole Miss did it last year. You know, Lane Kiffin was the talk of the town on, you know, Sports Center top ten all the time, throwing clipboards. So, you know, why can't we be that, you know, next uh, next firecracker in the SEC? Yeah. Uh, lastly, it'll be short, sweet, very quick, is tight ends. Yeah. Uh-oh. I mean, there's not that many of them, and a lot of people don't think they're that important, which is kind of rude, uh, <laughs> I would say. Because uh, I, I don't know why, but a lot of times it's like, oh, our special teams coordinator, the reason why he's here is to coordinate special teams, but he can also coach the tight ends. And it's it's so weird that so many coaches are other coaches, not just tight end. Like, the offensive line coach only coaches offensive line. Like, he does not coach anything else. And it seems like tight end is always a one or it's like, oh, no, no, he coaches something else. Um, well, it, yeah. actually is tr- it is actually true. When I was at Memphis, our tight ends coach was our special teams coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that happens literally all the time. Um, and sometimes guys don't get coached up until they get to the NFL. And then they're like, yeah. oh, this is how you pass block. Why did no one tell me how to do this? Um, yeah. But, yeah, so tight end position, obviously Pope, uh, Jacob Warren, those are the you know bigger names, the guys who've been here for a little bit. Um, and, I mean, we got to see them a little bit in team. You know, what we saw, I don't necessarily think they're going to be, you know, right next to the tackles, doing double teams with them in the run game. You know, they might be pulling around, kicking some defensive ends occasionally. But it seemed like more of slot play from them, where they're in the slot, they're, they're going out in routes and, and – you know, taking advantage of mismatches. And I know you said you saw that with Pope, correct? That is correct. So, um, yeah, I so Austin Pope entered the transfer portal, and I can promise you 
I would bet a lot amount of money that to, like sitting where he is ever tonight, like he's fired up that he came back because it seemed like he, uh, I don't know. I felt like he was like strutting around practice. Like he was like, you know, Eric Berry or, you know, Derek Barnett or Peyton Manning or any of the greats that we've had. But, um, and I don't know, maybe he was like having a nagging injury stuff because he would do some things, but wouldn't do other things. Um, but they put him in the slot a lot. I think that's going to be hopefully for blocking for our screens and stuff. That was a lot of stuff we saw was he was in the slot and he, he don't get me wrong. He still ran routes and stuff, but, um, and Jacob Warren's big old boy, he came by, he talked with you, he gave you a hug. Uh, he made the comment that he's just trying to pick everything up as best he can. Um, so I thought that was, uh, you know, that was pretty telling that he said that, but, um, a guy who I thought really impressed me in one-on-ones was, was Princeton, Princeton Fant, which like, he's actually been there like a hot minute. Like I do remember him making plays and, um, getting some, you know, well, obviously he's been there a little bit. I'm looking now, he's a redshirt senior. I knew he'd been around for a while. It just stinks because a lot of these guys like aren't super imposing. Like actually none of them are super imposing. Jacob Warren's a taller guy, but he's not like super thick or huge or anything, but, um, yeah, they're going to be kind of the unforgotten guys. We'll, we'll see. But Princeton Fant really like kind of stood out to me, at least, in one-on-ones and um, some different team stuff with making plays, you know, in, at least in the passing game. Yeah, and, I mean, if it, he's one of the more thicker ones out there because he's only 6'2 and then 240. So he's got a thicker build than, than the other ones. Um, but, you know – we're not quite sure how much the tight end is going to be used in this offense. So not quite sure how big of a role they're going to play, uh, how important their play is going to be. You know, last year their play was very important with the, with the offense that we ran, putting the running back seven yards deep, double tight ends, you know, working with the tackles and double teams up to linebackers, um, you know, being in pass protection, like, they played a huge role in the offense last year. And, and sometimes you don't want to put pass protection in the hands of a tight end or a running back. And that was what was happening was their best defensive end was rushing and a running back or tight end would be the one to pick him up. And it's just the rules they were following based on the offense, based on the pass protection, based on the defense that they were getting. And you never want that scenario. You want their best defensive end to be blocked by our best tackle. And I feel like our offense last year was not able to take advantage of that and really was not put together well because it was two tight end sets. Let's run the ball straight twice, and then it's third and long, and we're going to spread it out and go five wide with no running back in the backfield and five-man protection. And that is – Five-man protection is the hardest protection to do because you only got five, and if they're running games, they can get you off levels and, and really disturb the quarterback. There's no running back help. There's no running back out of the backfield for the quarterback to dump the ball to. So it it's the worst-case scenario you can put yourself in on third and long, and you just did it by running a mundane offense the first two downs. So now with – how this offense looks, you know, the fact that it's going to be shotgun, they're going to have running backs right next to them and they can run the ball and pass out of that. You're not going to necessarily know. It's not going to be so cut and dry like it was last year. It's like, obviously they're running the ball here or obviously they're passing the ball here. Um, So I, I'm glad to see that change in the offense. One thing, uh, one thing that, I, and this is an obvious statement that people would, you know, would think that would be coming with a high ball offense, but to, I saw a ton of RPO work. I mean, that's what they were doing. Like the first little bit of practice, like they would do it with just the, the quarterbacks and running backs. Then they did, did it quarterback, running back and receivers. And it was like, you're going to give it here. Or you're, I mean, you were working on all those things. Like I think Hypo was literally going to do everything that he could possibly do to not let the defense dictate to us. Now, I'm not saying it's going to work or it's going to be super prolific or anything like that because sometimes you just don't have the people to do it, and we'll find that out. But I think he's going to try to scheme up the best he can. And it's such a great point you made. It was run, run, which I like pounding the rock. And last year I thought we were going to have the offensive line to do it. But I then when we didn't get it, like you said, we go five wide. Five wide is literally the most ignorant thing in my mind to do 
because it leaves you so vulnerable. Plus, we didn't have we didn't have the personnel to do it. But anyways, um, yeah, offensively, I'm not going to sit here and say that I think they're going to be incredible or even that they're going to be really, really good. I do think that they'll be better than the defense, but that's speaking more about what I think about the defense. Um, but I'm also not going to buy into what our offense is doing against this defense. So yeah. I'll wait. I'll wait. Let me see the first game, first two games. Let I me mean, even see the let me but, even see the orange and white game. But you do feel like they're going to be a better offense than last year. That's a great point. Great question. And yes, yes, I do. Yes, yeah, exactly. So we're on the rise. That's we're heading in the right direction, which is what you want. Bingo. Um, good. That's that's good. Yes, that's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like I said, overall offense is looking really good. Defense eh, might need some help out there um would love if uh, some linebackers came back but we talked about that in the last pod and how you know if you're not with us you're against us so uh really appreciate everybody coming out uh, appreciate you guys listening uh rate and subscribe like and subscribe on youtube if you're watching there uh share with all your friends and family let them know that this is where you can get the best analysis of everything tennessee uh, you know, check out the other podcasts. Uh, follow me on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Kyler Kerbison. Uh, you can send questions or topics you maybe want us to touch on to uh, believe in Tennessee football at gmail.com or also text and call 865 322 9232. And we'll make sure and answer those. Um, but yeah, really appreciate it. And as always, the walls.